Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, your 38th favorite dad in the family community, Papa West, Jacob West. And no, your mind is not playing tricks on you. I am not Aaron Canole or A.A. Ron or whatever you want to call him. Um, but I am stepping into the role. I was about to say stepping into the chair. You can't step in chairs. You sit on chairs. I'm stepping into the role of hosting for him. Um, he does a lot. He needs a break. I'm here to give him a break. Um, and since I do a lot of stuff, I was the perfect guy for him to ask, apparently. Um, but yep, yeah, I am here for a movie battleground match. Uh, we've been doing this um, kind of invitational tournament. You win, you get thrown into the winner's tournament. You lose, you get thrown into the loser's tournament. Uh, and we are continuing that. Uh, it's fun. Most matches we've had, we have seen a veteran take on a rookie. Uh, this is one of those weird ones. Uh, we have someone who has never taken part in the debating at all versus someone who has never done movie Battlegrounds before, but has done a lot uh, as far as the debating goes. Uh, today we have Jonathan Peck, the head, uh, co-head of Sports Brawl, uh, who we have seen do a lot in, uh, especially late TV fights. I know when I was running that, um, competing in there, but then also hosting a crap ton of sports for all matches, taking on Chad Webb, uh, who I know a lot from TMG Trivia. Uh, we've seen him once in singles. We've seen him in teams. We will see him a lot more in teams, but you don't want to see my beautiful face throughout the entirety of this. We want to see people yell at each other. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in first Chad uh, to kind of see how he's hey. doing. Chad, how's it going today? Hey, it's going great. You know, I've been uh, preparing for this, you know, just watching some of these great movies, some of these not so great movies. Um, you know, as far as the debate stage goes, yeah, I haven't really formally um, debated that much. But hey, uh, I was a huge fan of movie fights. I watched every episode of that thing. And it's just something I've always been interested in. And I'm excited to be able to try my hand at it. Definitely. Move, uh, movie fights is kind of where we got the idea to do this. Yeah. Uh, but finally, finally getting your feet wet um, in the in the debating something everyone has to do eventually. We'll see how it works out. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring in your competitor to do the same exact thing to him. Uh, I'm also going to kick out Chad at the same point. Jonathan Peck. Uh, Jonathan, uh, you practically run Sports Brawl. Um, you, you just had someone come in to help you out, but you're still the main guy in that. Uh, and then we've also seen you debate in late TV fights. Finally getting into Movie Battlegrounds. How are you feeling today? Tired. <laughs> tired of not only uh it's very hot outside and also tired from personally hurting my back and brain sports bra luckily i have someone who can help me out on it so i don't want to pour it out again so and the person is very nice they're very charming i want to do it that way and well this is my first, yeah well for me this is my first time on battleground i just a couple matches almost like and, and also i watch a lot about episodes over here i always basically would give you guys even nerd fights along with it so this is the first time i actually did on the movie side of it it's been a little bit a long time coming but i thought i'm really gonna try to spread my wings if you will definitely uh spreading your wings and learn how to fly that was a song that someone saying at one point, don't worry, I will not get us demonetized. Um, but we're glad to finally have you in competing here. Um, thankfully, I'm not alone in this fact. I'm not judging at all. I'm just hosting this match. Uh, I do want to say a quick shout out to my judges, Chris Diaz, Haven Pendergast, and Jordan Anderson, who we will bring on in a little bit once we get to that point. But since y'all are both new to Movie Battlegrounds, I imagine y'all have seen some of the videos, so y'all know how this works. But for you at home, um, who doesn't know how this works, here's how this works. Uh, movie Battlegrounds, 
is uh, a best of five rounds first to three points wins. Each round is worth one point. Uh, each round we gave the competitors a question and they gave us answers and they will go in depth on that here in a second. Um, after the debating, uh, each, yeah, Aaron, I'm sorry. Um, each competitor, each judge will give their points. Uh, again, first to three wins. If we go into a tiebreaker, we will explain that later. Each argument is broken down into four stages. Your first stage is a 60 second opener. Your second uh, stage is a two minute solo pitch where this is just you talking. Um, stage three is four minutes. This is back and forth between the competitors. Reminder, this is both of y'all's four minutes. So please let the other person talk, but don't let the other person use the whole four minutes. And please do not speak over one another because when you speak over one another, you sound like children. I have children. They annoy me sometimes, especially when they're talking over each other. And then the last is your uh, one minute close. This is your final minute to fully sell us on the reason um, that your point is the correct point. So, um, Jonathan, you are technically the favorite because you spun your name first. Uh, so you will get the you will get us going first off um, as we get into question number one. Which question number one? Comedies. We love them. We hate them. Some make us laugh. Some are just annoying. Um, and of course, we live in the age of series where everything has to branch out. Um, and be a bigger picture. So our question for this match, what is the worst comedy series of all times? And as a series, uh, it has to have at least one sequel. It can have as many sequels as it wants, but as long as it has one, it qualifies. Uh, Jonathan, since you were the favorite, uh, you chose to go first on this round. You have one minute starts when you start talking. I'm going to call a certain wise man once said this. Not only this film success is successful, but also what ruined Hollywood on the same time, though. I know it's a bit of a stretch by saying that, but in explaining the majority of my arguments in a couple months, you understand why. My choice would be the Scary Movie franchise. And it's sort of origins based on it by the Waynes brothers. And if you really... The first Scary Movie was a huge hit, a surprise hit at the time, because it kind of sort of made the parody of a genre, a slasher genre, or basically kind of basically parodied Scream, even though Scream is sort of a parody of horror films to begin with. So, but besides that, it was a huge hit. Everybody seemed to enjoy it. But even after that, it kind of should have been one movie it's stabbed by the films. I'll explain more detail when I get the argument. So I picked the Scary Movie franchise. And stopping uh, right at the exact moment when his time stopped. That is great time management. Chad, you have one minute on the clock to open up your argument. Time starts when you start talking. Okay. <clears throat> the worst comedy series in film, or comedy series and film is a haunted house. There are currently only two of these things, but they are trying to milk all that is left from a dying genre of film parody. Um, if this style is ever to return, this is certainly not the franchise to bring it back. A haunted house squanders its potential because long stretches of these films are not smart or funny, and some of them are even offensive. Honestly, can't think of anything worse than having to sit through boring, tired, and offensive old tropes. There's nobody in this movie of note except for maybe uh, Cedric the Entertainer and half of the Wayans brothers. And then a lot of other parody films have had, you know, some really great comedic talent. And it's just, if you're going to, uh, you know, be kind of dumb and silly, at least bring the humor. Um, you know, and you even have like actors in this uh, getting Razzies like uh, Nick Schwartz and, um, or at least it was nominated for one, you know, beat out briefly by uh, Will Smith for After Earth. But, you know, uh, the humor is just really offensive in this one. And time. Again, stopping right as his time was done. Great job, both of you. Makes my job a whole lot easier. As we move on to the two minutes, again, this is building up your argument just a little bit more. And this is just you talking 
Jonathan, you are first up. Two minutes on the clock. Time starts when you start. What I mean by that, it's sort of kind of failed, well, it's failed with Hollywood, though. Not only they got a sequel out of it, but they're sort of forced into making the sequel to begin with because, by all accounts, by the Wayne's Brothers, it was sort of forced by doing the sequel by the Wayne scenes at Miramax. And basically, at first, they don't want to do it, and they forced them to do it. And it was sort of not regarded that even for the first scary movie, but exalted with the Wayne Brothers quitting the franchise along with it afterwards. But after with that, even with that though, they were basically a guy in genre when make what went wrong with parody films. And this is sort of the beginning of the end of parody films along with it. It was sort of like even more crass humor, mean humor, what you're joking around to begin with, and which just was never gotten more uh, do. And speaking around the humor along with it, you go back even like you watch even the original even films, a lot of the humor don't age that well. Apparently, even the first movie, like, you know, the way a doofy character was actually sort of parody of Deputy Dewey. If you really don't understand and try to do it, it just does not work at all. And I don't find any sort of enjoyment watching it. Even people about parody, and it was just too gross for too much gross of it. And not even subtlety along with it. So that's the reason it's sort of not only the launch of franchise, whether they shouldn't have sequels, but they kind of launched the beginning of the decline of spoof films in general. Well, at least with your film, though, at least they're trying to fix whether Nine Drama has already been dead to begin with. Even the way he's trying to fix the what went wrong to begin with as a whole. So I think that was a little bit trying to say right here. And these sort of build up something very unique along with it, even though those are so as a whole, at least they were trying. For us, with the rest of this franchise, I don't think it sort of deceived any of it. Even after the wins are gone, it just got worse and worse and worse. All right, uh, Jonathan, stopping with a little bit of time on there. Um, if you have time left and you decide to quit talking, please say you concede the rest of your time. That way we don't have that weird, awkward silence of me um, right. just waiting for you for that time to run out and no words coming out at all. But anyway, uh, that aside, Chad, two minutes on the clock to build your argument. Time starts when you start. Hey, uh, parody films getting worse and worse over time is is actually correct. I mean, the scary movie franchise, you know, started to it, it, a part of it was kind of genius. Like I watched some of this and, you know, they were, uh, you know, build, building on they were using a lot of the editing uh, techniques and especially scary movie, two And in the first one, the first two. Um, you had a lot of like great scenes with like the um, beginning of parodying The Exorcist, where um, you know they they they're all surrounding the piano and then they just uh, perform the uh, sh uh, what a shake your ass or whatever and it, it's just really hilarious and then it cuts to the um, the daughter peeing for like an extended period of time and then even one person even has a thing uh, shouts she's good and so it's just like the use of editing in those movies um, you know but like. If you want to talk also about like, you know, offensive stuff, you know, you have like these long sequences in a haunted house where um, you have Nick Schwartzen come in and, you know, yeah. So uh, his whole thing is he's a gay psychiatrist, right? So he wants to, um, you know, uh, sexually assault uh, Marlon Way Wayans uh, character because a gay man is probably going to try and sexually assault you when he comes into your home, right? No, it's weirdly offensive and it goes on for a really long time with the same joke. Just many examples of how the psychiatrist wants to have sex with Marlon Wayans. But, um, you know, Marlon, he has to be insistent that he's not gay, right? And the um, in fact, the idea of it is repulsive to him. And it's just like, this is even later. Like, you know, I'm not saying we should give a pass to, you know, scary movie for anything that it did in, in its past. But even later, I feel like we should be even more, uh, you know, hard, hardcore against it because, you know, we're, com we're coming to an age where we should be more accepting of people. And I just feel like this movie just didn't really make good use of its time, whereas the scary movie franchise certainly did. And time. I'm going to go ahead and 
bring myself back in. All right. So as we get into the four minute mark again, the, or not the four minute mark, the four minute round. This is my favorite round where we yell at each other. Uh, Jonathan picking the scary movie franchise. Chad picking uh, the Haunted House series. Again, I want to know which one is worse. Uh, this is four minutes for y'all to duke it out. Again, the only thing that I ask is that you don't talk over each other. Four minutes on the clock. Time starts when anybody talks. So, I mean, you talk about, like, parody dying with the scary movie franchise. Honestly, it kind of caused a resurgence of the parody franchise because each one of these movies are, like, making, like, quarter of a billion dollars. And, you know, whereas the, the other one hasn't made that much. And it's also, like, the first scary movie was, like, uh, really well uh, received by the critics. It's almost a fresh movie, um, like 52% or something like that. Um, whereas the other one's like 9% and it only got worse after that. I mentioned earlier, like, not only the Sesame movie also succeed at the genre, but also killed in the same time. While I was referring to that, it was basically after they should have been sort of the series to begin with. Well, at least with Haunted House, though, they, at least they tried to at least do something new with the, with the found for the genre with paranormal activity. At least with the, they at least built up the humor in here until the big, um, even... Um, even when Marlon's playing the character or played a little subdued compared to the other films that he's already done until the big humor stuff later on uh, throughout the first movie though at least the franchise at least Haunted House franchise at least were trying basically doing a little side different what's scary I mean movies? you can <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, you can you can try all you want, but, like, that doesn't mean you're going to succeed. I think Scary Movie really tried. They, like, had, like, some, like, great cinematography and editing in their their shots. Like, they had, like, one joke just to show, like, the care and, um, you know, preciseness of the shot where they have, like, all the flies coming in when the priest skips out on his taxi, goes up, and then he's, uh, you know, saying these like prayers like the demon exercise it and then it turns into like a, a diarrhea joke and but it, and diarrhea is not necessarily funny on the face but the way they do it with the editing and just like you don't see him on the toilet until the very end when he actually goes to the bathroom and i think that's brilliant whereas in a haunted uh house you know you have that whole part with nick schwartzen coming in and the tiger joke is just he's gay so he's gonna be you know sexually attracted to marlon wayans and then you have other types of tropes in this franchise where it's like oh yeah the black people are going to be in the house up against the the ghosts and of course they're going to be the ones that are going to run away because they're not like the crazy white people who you know would stay in the house basically and i just feel like it's just tired and it's not going and anywhere at least they were trying to do something a little subverted, though. Well, granted, I will give you the name of the first movie, but even afterwards, it just kind of got worse and worse and worse with it. At least it stopped being trying to be more clever in there. Even after the Wayne's left for after the second scary movie, they did try to like the old like Harry things on the book. It's kind of sort of losing his sort of his little bit of a charm, some idea of what they tried to do in the first place. Even some type Perry movies, that even is not even the horror genre. It was just pairing it, what movies is 10 tropics of the week, though. It just lost you at that test. I mean, you try to parody to begin with. It doesn't matter if you're parodying stuff in the horror genre. It's just a parody film. Like, if they bring other topical stuff from the time and they are able to make people laugh about that, I think that's great. And Scream's one of my favorite franchises. I think they did a great job of just kind of, like, subverting, like, that thing. And you said it's kind of like a negative to take, like, something that's kind of comedic, where I strong disagree. I think Scream is a great horror film. And then, um, you know, they they take it and they make it like so smart. Like they have the joke where, you know, she goes to uh, get a weapon to defeat Ghostface and she has a grenade, knives and a banana. She chooses the banana. That's classic comedy. That's There's nothing like, like that in the haunted house films. It's not smart. At least you try to get out of the horror film. They were trying to pair something else. It's just not that clever. And time. All right, gentlemen, we are at that final moment. Uh, of these rounds. We are at the closing. Uh, Jonathan, since you started us off, you are starting off with your closing. One minute to fully sell it. Time starts when you start. What I'm trying to get here with Scary Movie is this. 
and yeah, of course, you may say like, well, we, we lost the parody genre, spoof genre. But like I mentioned, kind of instances, it kind of killed it at the same time and the long haul along with it. The reason I meant by that, because we got some other parody films I and mean, then afterwards, it kind of like, it was sort of making a run afterwards. It took maybe the wrong approaches when scary movie trying to do as a franchise guy, even from well, worse, even with the sequels in general. It would basically, even if it kind of launched with epic movie and extreme movie or even date movie along with it, too. I mean, not only like bad Perry films, even worse movies. I felt like if it doesn't really be a franchise to begin with, or even worse comedy series around that point, though, I think scary movie might be a top of it. If you can't feel like maybe one movie, oh, they would be more fun along with it. If they keep dragging on and on, it's just later to that point, it will be not that funny anymore. All right, oh. and time. With that, Chad, it is your <laughs> minute to close us out. Time starts when you start. I think Scary Movie came in and it revitalized the parody genre from the back from the days of Airplane. And, you know, I don't think it matters, like, you know, if it tailed off, I think. A Haunted House is just one of those big, um, you know, kind of like things coming from Scary Movie. But like it's that's why I think it's the worst, because like it doesn't do anything original, anything inventive, anything, um, you know, funny. It's not even enjoyable to watch. Like, you know, Scary Movie at least has like all of these great, you know, talents in there. It's got Tim Curry in the second one, David Cross in the second one, Chris Elliott in the second one, and they're all bringing it. They're acting, they're hilarious, they're crushing it. And, you know, I was watching, I was enjoying watching these, but I had, I, I had no enjoyment of watching A Haunted House at all. It was just the same tired and offensive tropes over and over again. It was just the product of the dying thing, but I think the resurgence came with Scary Movie. And time. All right, uh, both Jonathan and Chad, great job in this uh, first round. I was able to hear everything uh, from the four minutes on as we bring in the judges. As y'all take some time, just some fact-checking stuff. Uh, so far, the Scary Movie franchise, we have had five movies come out. 2000, 2001, 2003, 2006, and 2013. Um, Scary Movie has the highest uh, Rotten Tomatoes rating at 52. They did uh, Scary Movie 2 was at 14%. 3 and 4 were both at 35%. And Scary Movie 5 had a great 4% on Rotten Tomatoes. There is a sixth film being announced that should come out this year. It is said to um, spoof Child's Play, Get Out, Scream Season 3, Unfriended, It Chapter 2, and Happy Death Day, among others. Whereas The Haunted House, there have been three films uh, that came out in 2013 and 2014. Um, 2000, the first one had a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes, the second with an 8%. Back in 2018, there was supposed to be a third film, but it was soon canceled after they talked about it coming out. So with that, uh, Chris, I have you here first. You look like you're ready. Who is getting your point and why? So that's how I get back and forth today. Uh, I have to find one of them. We get back and forth today. But I think had a lot to write at the end. Just because getting more examples of why it film was bad. I want to think you were just pulling out fast. I want to get you more of a dance for some of this film. We consider it a bad work coming to me. And had to let the end mentioning how all right, so Chad getting the first vote. Haven, I'm now moving on to you. Same question I asked Chris. Yeah, I'm going to go with, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm also going with Chad. He just brought in a lot more. You know, he made a case why his movie was worse, and he made a lot of good points as why Jonathan's movie wasn't the worst in the series or in history so i'm going with chad all right chad uh getting it jordan uh because it was a unanimous decision i i don't need your opinion but i will ask you one thing take my strong hand with that <laughs> uh i will kick all three of y'all out chad getting the first nice. point <laughs> as we move thank you 
as we move on to question number two. Um, question number two, what is the best theatrical film made by a Game of Thrones director? Uh, the lovely uh, television series that everyone loved all eight seasons of, no bad seasons to be named, and what a fantastic ending. But with that, uh, Chad, we are starting off with you. You have a minute to open this up. Okay. The, the Descent is the best theatrical film made by a Game of Thrones director, Neil Marshall. After our main character experiences a tragedy, she joins a group of friends to go spelunking in a cave. Little does she know, one of the friends picks a different unmapped cave that leaves them all trapped and fending for their lives from the horrors within. Neil brought so much care and detail to this film by building these elaborate cave systems uh, set that make the film feel so claustrophobic. It really raises the stakes of the movie while keeping the actors safe. People do die in this film and you get really great, a really great final girl in Sarah Carter. The title of the film is even special because it at first alludes to a physical descent into the cave, but it can also refer to a mental descent into madness for all of the characters, but especially for uh, the tragic Sarah, as it turns into kind of a Lord of the Flies situation. The monster design and makeup are all outstanding and they add a another level to the nightmare fuel of that is the descent. And time. All right, Jonathan, we're moving on to you. Your minute opening. Time starts when you start. Mark Mulloyd. You might never heard his name. We heard the episodes he directed. Ice Sparrow. Sons of Harpy, The Broken Man, No One, Stormburn, The Queen's Justice. So I'll just say, well, like, you get a friend's accent. There's a film he did, and I just want to get this year correctly. I think it's the year 2002, if I agree. It's a comedy about what is it, Ray? Right? Not technically, not only sort of Mark Mary but a film that very much interesting. And this man directed a movie called He Directed That. And the reason why he directed that, because it's such a Sasha Branko. And I, the reason I picked that, because it to kind of prove this little surprise that he actually directed that. And funny, with it. So I'll explain more detail to that. So that'll be Allergy the Abbey House. And time. <laughs> All right, so we have Jonathan with LAG in the house, Chad with The Descent. Chad, we are moving on to your two minutes uh, to build your argument. Time starts when you do. Okay, so Neil Marshall actually made the decision to make the cast an all-women cast instead of a mixed cast because he felt women were un unrepresented in horror genre, and they are. Um, so, you know, this film really like dives deep into these characters um, psyches like there's a uh, you know kind of a love triangle with a, a cheating woman and you know you get the suspense because the woman finds out later that you know she was cheating and there's actually like a lot of surprises with this movie where uh, one of the ladies kills one of the other uh, ladies that uh, she's with and um, she, it's happened so suddenly and it's just you know, and then so, so, some of these things with uh, there, they have like these this uh, night vision sequence where you know they don't even use like music because it's unnecessary. Where you know a thing like just kind of pops out in the in the and the or it's just standing there actually in the background, and you, it takes you a second, but then you like realize it's there. Just the scares are just so good in this movie, and I just really applaud that decision to you know build real sets, include a lot of like great women in this, a lot of unknowns, but like they really brought it with the acting. Whereas for Ali G, like I thought this was gonna be like Borat, like really good where, you know, you he's the character and then he goes and he has like the, the real like reaction 
reactions from a lot of different people, but no, it's entirely scripted. You waste a lot of performances from like Michael Gambon and Chris Dance. They're in this movie and they feel so wasted. It's just a bunch of jokes about how his penis is huge and about, you know, making uh, fun of women, like fat women and fat people in general. And it's just like a lot of really lame, offensive jokes. Like they're talking about like a little boy's pubes or at some point. And I'm like, that's not fucking appropriate. And I'm just like, you know, I don't understand the comedy in this movie and why they think a lot of the stuff is funny, but it just doesn't really work. And it's kind of like weird to put up a movie that's offensive, but women against a movie that's so great for women. And time. All right, Jonathan, we are now moving on to your two minutes. Time starts when you start. Okay, now. We mentioned Borat. At least we have Borat in the movie. At least we got well established actors in there, like Michael Gammon, Charles Dance, Martin Freeman. At least they have well established people in there. Yeah, comic can be very subjective. And let's be honest, that's more Sasha Baron Cohen touring after this movie of it. Let's be honest with that. But this film was kind of sort of the starting up point and even curiosity kind of launching point who Sasha Baron Cohen I uh, would do sort of the bar after the story, which I kind of more of a linear to tech this schoolhouse along with it and basically try to do anything kind of without being sort of demolished. That's where he does everything what he does along with it. You have that peaking dream sequence in the beginning of the movie, which is hilarious. It's just sort of like basically so over the top and natural. Well, like, not natural, it's just so over the top, you felt like it's a little too extreme along with it. And basically, when well, the drug humor along with it, it was just sort of like that. We all kind of know this off going later on, though. And this is sort of the starting up point along with it. And I think without this movie, I don't think we had sort of get Bora sort of and any other commies. I want comics for him, though, do it go better. Fourth to the set, though. Look, I like the descent. I love the movie when they do. And you're right about one thing, though. Women, this isn't going to have a little breast, breast expectation more than horror that way it should have. But I feel like there were a little better movies along with that, though, if basically with Hereditary along with it, any other horror movies along with it is sort of next example of that. So I still like the descent, but I felt like there was a little bit a little oof right here, though. That's the reason. And also, Allergy had sort of like this sort of like rap one music being all along with that. So, and basically, along with that. And time. All right. We're moving on to the four minutes. Battle out, gentlemen. Time starts when someone starts. Yeah, like I'd rather have, you know, rather than like a bunch of well-established actors that are wasted in a movie, I'd rather have like a lot of no names that can come in and like prove what they have. And I feel like all of these actresses just nailed this role. They just really sell. I mean, because they're they're in this built like cave system, right? But they sell like they're trapped and they were betrayed by this one girl who's like, I wanted to find out. I wanted us to discover this cave system, but then you just, you know, realize that everyone it feels such betrayed. And then the uh, the um, tragic uh, nature of this one girl that, uh, you know, has to sell that. And then she becomes like this great final girl. It's kind of like Ready or Not, like great movies like that, where she ends up like all bloody and she's like, badass and just wailing on these monsters. It's just so great. Whereas Ali G just like, it just squanders. I mean, yeah, comedy's subjective, but like sometimes it's just like, you know, offensive. And I just feel like, you know, it's it's just weirdly contrasted with the the straight performances from the, you know, the well-established actors. Like Martin Freeman embarrasses himself in this movie. It, it's gross. You mentioned ready or not, though. I will argue that that's really sort of better point when you point out earlier with The Descent, and I think it was a better movie that was kind of around with that with the allergy, though. I know it's a little bit weird to see these actors in that part, but, but that's the point of the sort of the movie, though. It took a little sort of absurdism when they do it, and that's a little credit to Sasha Maricone as a performer in general, though. He took some maybe weird, absurd ideas, 
put weird established actors along with it. And now it's sort of like sort of a character, it's sort of at least a sort of story along with it. They were basically, it's a little simple story. He's basically trying to save a school along with it from the prime minister. So basically he did everything along with it. He caused some shenanigans along with it. And basically, yeah, the character will bit progress right here, but that was basically thrown along with it. So they did everything you could. At the end of the movie, posted he becomes like the British ambassador to Jamaica. Would they not gonna say too much detail in the movie? That's Corpus World Territory, but for what to do at the end, I think it's sort of weirdly satisfying along with it. So it's sort of like a weird idea, but I mean we are construct of an idea, but it, you go along with it, it has at least a so look. More than that. I mean, I get it. This movie kind of has a plot. You know, that's fine. It makes it a movie, but, you know, it's barely a movie. It, like, doesn't do the great character work that The Descent does, you know, that Ready or Not does. I mean, I don't want to talk about Ready or Not. That's not the point of the debate here. Um, it's just The Descent. From the list that we got of movies from Game of Thrones directors, that was the best one on there. And honestly, I'm glad it was on there because I... I love that movie so much. I think it did such a great job for, you know, being in the horror genre and for women in horror. And I just think, you know, it does a lot more than what Ali G does. And, you know, Ali G is just no Borat. And it, and I just feel like maybe if they could have done more of a Borat type thing, it would have been a much better movie because Borat's pretty great. I mean, Sasha's got skills. He just didn't show it in Ali G in the house. At least with that movie, sort of a stepping stone of what he could have done with Lair and Use with Bart. This is sort of the stepping stone of it, and it's sort of a ascent afterwards. And this is sort of the first taste of it, what it's actually going to be with Ali Chi, though. Well, like I said, with the descent, still a good movie, and a lot basically moves along with it. But I think there are other horror movies along with it that did a little bit better. At least with Ali Chi, it's a little bit more out there. But at least you'll go along with it. Sure. When it's a certain I agree that The Descent is a good I movie. I would say that. even a great movie. I don't think Ali G is even a good movie. It's stupid. Time. Well, All stupid. right. Again, great back and forth, gentlemen. Uh, we are now moving on to the one minute close. Chad, since you started us off, you will start off the closings one minute to finish up this argument. <laughs> The Descent um, came out at around a great time in the um, the early 2000s, and it just like really kind of crushed the type of movie that it is. It's just a fun cave movie that really like they, um, you know, I just think it's so cool that like they built all these elaborate sets and just the, the way they uh, uh, have these stakes in the movie, you really feel like you're in there with these girls. And, you know, they go through some crazy shit. It's really on the edge of your seat horror. And I just feel like, you know, it's so well done. And there's so much, like, drama mixed in, too. There's, like, the messages of, you know, being lost and, you know, just all of these themes and just, you know, missing the tragic people that you lost. Whereas, you know, Ali G just, like, makes a fool out of everybody's that in it and makes these lame jokes jokes about um you know huge penises and stuff like that and it's just not and well time all right jonathan final minute in this argument to close it up time starts when you start talking comedy is stupid but that's what makes it funny it's so stupid along with it that's the reason for it's intriguing about it it makes a little intrigue of the shenanigans that allergy does it makes the shenanigans that at least some I was talking about like the prime minister played by Michael Gavin, but it's oblivious to the situation along with it. That's what sort of like the weird charm of the movie. It sort of like brings it in this sort of weirdness approach along with it, and it brings it like, how is it when they're going to do this, or how does this even sort of even seeing this and watching this? That's sort of a genius of Sasha Man Cohen's comedy. Throughout it, though, I don't think we would have Borat or other projects along with that without Ali G. Though I felt like there was a little bit more layers to along with it that's being given credit for, and I think this movie kind of shows it along with it. So, so I think it's a more funny movie, and some people mostly giving the credit for it. So, all right, 
and mm -hmm. time. All right, as we kick both these gentlemen in the back and get our judges for the judging phase, uh, Chad, who picked The Descent, directed by Neil Marshall. Neil Marshall directed two Game of Thrones episodes, Blackwater and Watcher on the Wall. And then Mark Mylod, uh, Jonathan's pick, six films, including Broken Man and No One, which ended season six. So with that, are my judges all ready? Yeah. All right. Haven, we're going to go ahead and go to you first. Who gets your vote and why? Uh, <clears throat> I'm going with Chad. Um, he picked The Descent. He made a great case of an all-women's cast. He made a great case of the empowerment of women. And he uh, the opposing argument he made, which um, the film by Jonathan was offensive to women, lame-ass jokes, uh, The Descent had badass, a final girl, and quote, Chad, t August, uh, whatever day this airs, 2021, he said, Ali G is stupid. End quote from Chad. So I'm going with Chad. All right. All right. Take his picture, uh, make a quote out of it, post it everywhere. Jordan, we did not talk to you last time. We will go ahead and talk to you now. Um, who gets your vote and why? And you are muted just to let you know. There we go. All right, is that better? <laughs> better. So, uh, so I got to go, with Chad, just because uh, uh, I think he made some really strong points about about the movie. Kind of talking about the the women in the in the movie, also the the final girl, Sarah Carter, uh, and then the design of the monsters. Just like the whole trapped in, in a in a cave film, and then also to, to kind of counter, he he talked about how a lot of the 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 uh, more uh, big name actors in in Ali G were were kind of wasted, and, and then also uh, uh, just like he, he also kind of talked about about how the back and forth with the with the comedy versus the the, the straight actor didn't really work, and so and, and also he did talk about the 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 unknown actresses from the Descent uh, being able to prove themselves and and like make a, a solid movie. So yeah, I'm gonna go chat. All right, so Chad getting the point. Chris, your opinion does not matter, um, but it looks like you would have gone with Chad anyway. Uh, Chad taking the 2-0 lead as we go on to question number three. This is make or break for Jonathan. You have to get this uh, correct. And this is a pretty easy question. What is the worst Wizarding World film? This, of course, talking about... Harry Potter and the World of Hogwarts. Many films, many uh, people love them. I don't know which one is the worst. So, Jonathan, this is Make or Break. We are starting off with you with your one minute opening. I think as a casual somebody, you want to get into the Harry Potter movies. Well, the, usually the person you got asking if you want to get in the movies, I think there was one movie I think you might want to skip on, except for maybe the ending, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I picked uh, Harry Potter and Half-Blood Prince. And the reason this movie existed because of the ending. We're going to put classic spoiler, but that's over. But it's been like 10 years at this point. Dumbledore dies at the end by Snape. So he kills him, <laughs> along with it, and that's it. And when people watch this movie, they usually you go to that part is the best part of the movie. And when people ask you about what happens beside that point, they don't remember it. They don't remember it. They just feel bored. And some of this is not interesting along with it. It's kind of a bit dragged out, dull, and the lighting's very bad. I'll spend more to that when we get to the argument. So, have our press. And your time is up, Chad. We're moving on to you with your one-minute opener. Time starts when you start. The worst movie in the Wizarding World franchise is The Crimes of Grindelwald. <clears throat> After the fantastic conclusion of the Harry Potter saga, we got these two Fantastic Beast movies, and they were less than fantastic. The main difference between these two sagas is J.K. Rowling tried her hand at screenwriting with the Fantastic Beast movies. We didn't have Steve Clovis anymore. 
Rowling is a great book writer, but even in the book, she has these really long expository paragraphs that feel so wordy. And this is also how she writes dialogue in her screenplays. Crimes takes the characters we cared about in the first movie and puts them on the sideline for the bigger Grindelwald story, a much less compelling story. When we hear Fantastic Beast Bro, give us some dope ass beasts. It feels like Rowling further backtracking and convoluting the lore of Harry Potter in this movie, pulling a George Lucas like he did, you know, coming out with all these other things things that nobody cares about and you know i feel like if you want to do a grindelwald thing do a separate thing give us more beasts more newt's commander like a lot of great stuff like that in these movies. and time all right jonathan we are moving on to your two minute section time starts when you start tell you what the half our friends is this if you watch through a movie along with it, and the majority of the film is sort of love interest right here, or sort of a fake potion along with it, there's some weird unbalanced comedy right here, when the majority of the story along with it is sort of a dark, crazy themes along with it, it doesn't usually match very well. And I imagine you bring in Grindelwald on here, I uh, to think, let's just put people on this is sort of a prime example of David Gates, right during director films afterwards though, kind of like doesn't know how to sort of like what his really his style is it was just more of a bleak idea it just doesn't feel any it kind of drains the color out it would just kind of looks ugly to look through that and it just was not very interesting along with that even some of the stores right here like i said like the ending out you don't remember watching like the rest of the movie along with it you don't remember basically run was a love dilemma along with it with this crazy girls that have weirdly obsessed with crush with it. You don't remember basically that lots of slughorn along with it and sort of like making the potions right here. You don't remember <clears throat> sort of like a weird sort of like pink paint right here. And you don't remember pretty much the movie that was sort of like back to PG, which is like find a bit surprising even doing research right here because the last year it was like the PG-13. It went to PG and it didn't have sort of the dark things on it, even you tried to do that. So that's a little bit more baffling. And it just didn't feel like it was sort of two hours to get through. You know, I had to ask someone, it's like, yeah, I spent two hours watching it. It's like, no, you don't. Know just watch the ending along with it. And that's pretty much it. And even people who watch the movie get to the end, it's like, what the hell? I spent like two and a half hours watching this movie. So I think that's kind of more unnecessarily. It kind of feels like only it's filler. The movie, basically. And time. All right, Chad, we're moving on to you with your two minute section. You just said something about people watch this movie and go, uh, I don't know what I just watched. That's Crimes of Grindelwald. Pretty much unanimous uh, them saying that when Crimes came out. And I even like was sitting there thinking like, is this the end of Harry Potter stuff now because of Crimes of Grindelwald? Are we going to get any more? Thankfully, yes. And thankfully we're getting Steve Clovis back for the third one and they're recasting Johnny Depp. You know, no offense to Johnny Depp. He's a good actor, but you know, I feel like Mads Mikkelsen is going to do a much better job you know, and, you know, I just feel like, uh, you know, I have to make like a really good defense now of Half-Blood Prince because, you know, you're kind of trashing it a little bit. I get it. You don't like the movie. You don't think people should watch it. I do like that you said that the ending is dope because the ending is very dope. Um, I love how they adapted this movie and they even kind of elevated it from the book because you get that great uh, se sequence uh, or there's great uh, bunch of sequences with uh, the Felix Felicis where you have Daniel Radcliffe flexing his comedic chops um, and then you have uh, that great scene that's pivotal um, between um, uh, Jim Broadbent and Daniel Radcliffe where they uh, talk about Harry's mother and how he loved Harry's mother and she was a bright student and how you know she gave him the fish and then when she died the fish vanished and then, you know, Daniel Radcliffe has the brilliant line where he just goes, you know, be brave like Lily or else he will disgrace her and the bowl will remain empty forever. And that's just a great metaphor, brilliantly added to the film, um, you know, transcending it from the novel. It wasn't even in the book. And, you know, you have like all these other great moments that, you know, because David Yates came in, made everything much darker 
but it had to be because Voldemort's back now. But he also didn't get rid of the light side of things with all the, you know, the romance aspect of it. And, you know, I just feel like all these nice little moments made this film something definitely worse to watch, not just the end. And time. All right, we're now going on to the four-minute battle. Which one's worse, the Half-Blood Prince or Crimes of Grindelwald? Four minutes on the clock. It starts when someone starts talking. Here's the thing with Crimes of Grindelwald, though. At least it has some, you mentioned dark elements. It had some very dark elements on there. It had some, like, a, well, yeah, there it is, but they had some very dark elements along with it, and also sort of like a shocking twist reveal with Beyond Queen turning basically with Grindelwald saw it, it was just shocking and basically like, wait, what? Like, how is this going to work? It's sort of shocking. Yeah, that's what people said is, how is this going to work? Does this even make sense from the lore? It, you know, she's expanding on this, but it's it doesn't make any logical sense. And I just feel like, you know, you talk about the dark elements um, is bit better in crimes, but Half-Blood Princess starts out the movie with all of these Death Eaters destroying a bridge and just, you know, causing terror all over the place. And there's you know, newspapers saying, you know, what the fuck are we going to do? Death Eaters are destroying everything. And then it ends so darkly. The, one of the heroes dies. Dumbledore dies. And it's Snape that does it. It's like everything he thought was, you know, going to happen. It's kind of happening. And you don't know yet in that movie that Snape is actually doing what Dumbledore says. And you just got to, like, kind of, like, take it on faith. And it's just, it ends so, you know, bleakly in that movie. And you talk about it's not dark, but then it also has the contrast with all the light moments, lighter moments too in that film. What I mean by that, it's like basically just a little jarring at points. It just feels a little bit trying to do it. Like I mentioned earlier, Ron sort of weird romance with this chick, basically sort of somehow assessed all of her and looks Giannis. Ron's not very much a good looker along with it. So basically sort of- Hey, I'll take a piece of that. <laughs> well, that's really neat, Joe. Oh, and, uh, I mean, but but, but what well, I try and point out what, okay. I, what I mean to say that is like that was sort of like a weird scenario when you try to make more of a darker story. It was trying to be more like that. Like I mentioned earlier, there's filler. It's the kind of weird, unnecessarily filler along with it when they try to make sure more branch on the sort of the story goes. And it's sort of like trying to do basically what the whole process is along with. And like I mentioned like here, if you take out the ending, what is it really remembered about that movie? Take it out of it. A lot of stuff. Basically with Grenroll, though, at least you had some of going forward, though. You have a, even though it's a very short amount of time, you have a very good performance by Drew Law's Dumbledore, young Dumbledore, by the way. It actually had the story of by Nicholas Flamel along with it. And that was actually uh, some of the better relationship of Deuce Commander and Jacob along with it when we branch out from the first Fantastic piece. At least there's some of the dynamic was there, at least some levity. So you want to talk about like the romance being a weak part of the movie. I think it's great because these kids are now like 16, 17 years old. And you want you want to build these relationships. You want to show because you end the series with Ron and Hermione getting together. This is building on that. This is showing how they get together. And Ron builds up his confidence, you know, with the Quidditch, a Quidditch uh, a keeper. And um, you know, he yeah, he gets Lavender Brown. It's kind of a tryst, but it it makes them fall more in love. And I just love these little light moments that just give the franchise heart. And you want to talk about performances too? You have Tom Felton in this movie. Please do not forget about him. This dude brings Draco Malfoy, the kid that you hate for like five movies. And he brings this like great, uh, you know, story with him where he's troubled. He's trapped between, you know, wanting to do good for a school, but then also wanted to please his parents. And he doesn't want to die by the Dark Lord's hands. And, you know, you just have so much humanity and empathy. Um, you know, you have empathy for him in this in this uh, movies. And when he gets se Sectum Simp replaced upon him, you feel for him. And this is Draco Malfoy, the bully. And time. All right, we're now moving into the closing round. Uh, Jonathan, again, this is do or die, your final minute of the argument. Time starts when you start. I mentioned a kind of instances, it's filler. 
even won't stretch out filler. They sure should keep it a little bit more simple than the half part prints. Let's be honest, people kind of known even the most talk about the movie is the ending. Even people who had seen the movie read the book, like, oh, he's gonna die right there. So let's be honest, he's gonna ferment, he's gonna die right here. It's some of the shade of it when he gets frail or you know, old or what with it. So we all kind of know throughout this coming and at least. At least that part of the film, like if you're trying to get through the movie alone with it, it would just kind of the colors are drained out, the cinematography just felt a little weak, and it just feels like you just drained everything around it when seeing it. Though I just felt like it just sort of like even met your darker elements on it. Have to the previous movies right here, exploring like the dark elements like Gobble the Fire and Order of the Phoenix. I felt like those at least they had some darker elements what they try and do with half part prints though. So. What you think about the movie, just talk about the ending. Besides those, you don't remember any of it. And time. All right, Chad, we are now moving on to you. Your final minute of this argument. Time starts when you start talking. To basically say that, you know, uh, Crimes does better with cinematography. Not that awards are everything, but, you know, Half-Blood Prince was actually nominated for Best Cin Cinematography. It only lost because Avatar was in the race. You know, um, you can call anything filler or just use any cadence to kind of dismiss great parts of a film, but that just, that doesn't make it not great. And I just think, you know, all the performances from Tom Felton and Michael Gambon and Daniel Radcliffe, Daniel Radcliffe bringing some comedic chops to his performance it just makes harry just a more fun likable character when he gets that felix felicis and that's just such a fun great moment and there's just not that much fun stuff um in the uh, crimes of grindelwald you're just trying to figure out what the hell is going on there's just so much to do with like who the hell is uh, credence and then when you finally get there you're like wait he's a dumbledore what that doesn't even make any sense does it they betray a lot of the characters that you love from the first one um and i just think it just didn't do that great of a job um and, and it almost ruined time the and time all right as i kick y'all out we're gonna bring the judges in uh couple fact checks because i write stuff down uh half blood prince came out in 09 it is the sixth film of the harry potter franchise and is in fact the one dumbledore dies in uh runtime on it is two hours and 34 minutes crimes of grindelwald came out in 2018 at the moment it is the last harry potter film or wizarding world film there has been a third one announced however we do not know if it will actually come out and then two hours and 13 minutes as far as the runtime goes um, and then I did find a picture of the Daily Prophet uh, in the opening of Half-Blood Prince. The uh, headlines, Death Eater Terror Continues, Dark Forces Grow in Number, Goblin Negotiation Talks Break Down, House Prices Crash in Hogsmeade, Nothing Saying, De uh, Death Eater's Attack, What the Fuck Are We Gonna Do? Do with that what you will. But with that, uh, Jordan, it is your turn to start this one. Who gets your points and why? So sorry, Jonathan, but I gotta give it to Chad this time. I just, I just think that 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 he just brought it a little stronger. Like one of the big things is for me was that you you call it a Fantastic Beast, the, the, the crimes of Grindelwald, but where are the where are the badass beasts? Like dude, you 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 don't, you don't really have very many cool looking beasts. And then also, uh, uh, you don't really have enough Newt's commander too. I like that point. And then also too, uh, just. Uh, talking about about some of the things that, that were actually good about uh, Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince, like uh, going back to the ending, we said the ending is is uh, dope. So to make another quote, the ending is dope. That's what he said. Quote him on that. And then also the the um uh, the whole dialogue between uh, Jim Broadbent and, and Daniel uh, Radcliffe, I thought that was a, a great scene as well. But but. But so I was happy to, to have him bring that up, and also too bringing up the fact that that um, Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince was uh, uh, nominated for the cinematography. So some some good points overall. So I, yeah, I got to give it to Chad. All right, so Chad getting the first vote. We are now moving on to Chris. Chris, who gets your point and why? I am like he repeated the tiny fact and I put on it, and I thought Chad had it first, but I think I was gonna keep hitting back and back. And kind of keep defending half of print, but did it try to cover any of the criticism of the positive thing that Jonathan was saying back kind of original of the way from one but I said keep doing and doing it, I was just want me over again. Even though I hate trying to build a little more after I still tell it down this 
All right, so we have one vote for Chad, one vote for Jonathan Haven. You are the deciding vote. Who wins this point and why? I'm going with Jonathan on this one. You know, he stuck to his guns for his movie. You know, and he, he said it a couple times. I know what uh, Jordan was trying to say. He did say that the ending is memorable, but I like that he broke down a lot of stuff that, you know, wasn't so memorable in the film. And he has some good points about the crimes of Grindelwald. You know, if, uh, if, if Chad would have picked the movie in the first seven, then they could have probably been better because everybody knows that movie sucks ass. Nobody fucking cares about the crimes, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to go with Jonathan. Exactly. That movie sucks. <laughs> watch it. All right, so Jonathan getting that point, avoiding the knockouts as we bring both gentlemen in. Uh, as we move on to question number four. Question, what is the best psychological horror film of all time? We didn't give you a time frame. We said any time. So with that... Uh, Chad, you are going first on this one. A minute to open up. Time starts when you start talking. Hereditary is the best psychological horror film of all time. Hereditary lives and breathes unease and dread, already putting you in the shoes of this family that is being controlled like playthings. We see this foreshadowed with the slow camera crawl into the dollhouse that is the Graham family home. The film is so intricately crafted with so much detail that proves every shot and sequence is necessary and adds to the overall quality and rewatchability of this film. Although it's also so effective, you might need a breather before you decide to pop the Blu-ray back in. The film at its core is a commentary on familial trauma and mental illness with a great horror shell about demonic possession and blends these themes spectacularly. The performances from Tony Collette and Alex Wolf alone make this film spectacular. This movie is very well regarded by fans and critics alike, and even one of my favorite critics, Dan Merle, has praised this film, and the great Martin Scorsese has praised this film. It's a really great horror classic. Already. And time. All right, Jonathan, your turn to open up your argument. A minute on the clock. Time starts when you start. I'm going to get this quick disclaimer out of the way. I'm not the sort of big knowledge on horror films, but the ones that really intrigue me is more something to make you think and make you chill at the same time. You get these two things are very balanced along with it. At least you have a great movie on your hands. I'm referring to Silence of the Rhymes, directed by Jonathan Demi. This movie, it brings, took like a schlocky book that's sort of based on it, this novel, and basically is like make more, and make more more chilling, one of the most chilling films, not only from the 90s, and also most influential film the last couple of years, though. So this movie, Silence of the Rhymes, is really not only a great horror movie, but a great movie in general. So it brings cold, calculated, and chilling scenes along with that. I'll explain more when I get to the main argument. So my choice will be Silence of the Lambs. All right. I'll take that as you are conceding the rest of your time. So with that, Chad, we're moving on to you with your two-minute section. Time starts when you start. Okay, when we talk horror, I just feel like Hereditary is like much scarier and way more of a horror film than Silence of the Lambs. As Silence of the Lambs has some horror elements to it, but I feel like it's more of a mystery drama film. You know, once you get into this film, you watch it, you get what's going on, you see the mystery of it, you you go, okay. And then, you know, it doesn't have as much rewatchability as Hereditary does. Hereditary has so much supplanted in here that you watch it for a second time and you go, oh my God, I didn't even notice that the first time. And it just kind of lives inside of you. And you kind of like experience this trauma with this family. You know, you get this great performance from Tony Collette and Alex Wolf, and they're just both kind of going at it. You know, she never wanted a son, you know, and, you know, you kind of feel this, you know, fear of her 
uh, passing on her mental illness to her son. And she even has like these terrifying sequences of uh, dousing him with gasoline and herself. And they're like catching fire. Like a lot of people are catching fire in this movie. There's like a decap decapitation scene uh, with uh, Charlie, the daughter. And then it just kind of jump cuts to her head on the street. This is a terrifying movie. And then just the way it slowly uh, br brings you to this conclusion where, you know, uh, they're, they, they lose in the end, you know, the one guy, they, they are all the, um, cult leaders are, uh, cultists are praising, hailing Paymon and, um, you know, they've lost and in silence of the lambs, the villain escapes. It's just like, he's, he's basically, um, you know, uh, kind of praised in a way, like you root for him to escape and it's just not very realistic um, in a way. And there's also a lot of weird transgender stuff that goes on with that movie. It doesn't really hold up as a movie either. Time. All right, Jonathan, two minutes to build up your argument. Time starts when you start. The question is, it's not about the most rewatchable million. Let's be honest, I don't think it's more in the sort of rewatchable films. And what Science of the Lambs does, I think that was bring like a, a filmmaking into it. It sort of like brings like, it brings like sort of like a feelness right here for Clark Sterling, played by Jerry Foster, which won Oscar for that part as Clark Sterling. And it brings, sort of like intrigue when you're about to interview Hannibal Lecter, which by the way, five minutes in the movie, and even when he's not even show up his face in the movie though, you feel like half his presence is there. They're playing mental mind games with Claire Storing all over it. That's sort of the chilling part. He didn't even do it throughout the majority and later on the film. When he does kill anybody, you always feel creeped out and even finally was chilling along with them even before he does it. That's a chilling part of the film. It brings like sort of like those, one of those things to a chilling aspect to it. It's sort of like it brings like weird stuff along with it with hereditary though. When I think about psychological horror, I don't count as more supernatural along with it though. But supernatural is more like it's more of a mental type of thing along with it it doesn't have mine doesn't definitely have that supernatural but it brings sort of like a mind games along with it very hunt like buffalo bill and it brings like some of the things along, along with it so i think signs of the lambs got what we for that even people who are not into the horror fans really appreciate the movie for not only the technical aspects to it, it's a branch of what we are sort of the screenplay you got so along with it. So not only the performances, elevate that and it's a top tier along with it. And that is time. All right, we're moving on to the four minutes. Chad picking hereditary Jonathan with Silence of the Lambs. This is the last uh, four minutes. So duke it out. We'll see who wins. Time starts when someone starts talking. The thing with Hereditary is this, though. Like, look, let's be honest, not very much movies are kind of rewatchable along with that way. It, the question is sort of about psychological horror film. It brings it sort of like to my games. Like I mentioned earlier, yours is basically more supernatural along with it. Like, you mentioned some of the, some of the gruesome stuff. People just send yourself on fire along with it. You guys are back to King has right here. It's a little more fucked up right here, which is great. It is, I did think, a more psychological if you take out sort of supernatural. Mine is more like supernatural and just sort of more chilling along with it. Even the job of Claire Stone was doing is sort of like a trying to like bring bring to that person along with it though. Even if, if you if you if you take out the supernatural, honestly it still works as like this, you know mind games with this lady she's slowly inheriting these um you know psychological uh trauma like these mental illnesses and she's afraid that she's going to pass it on to her kids and like if you even think about oh maybe all the supernatural stuff is in her mind 
that's actually kind of creepy too. But like, it's it's not that. They just blend the supernatural with the psychological element so well. But even then, it doesn't matter. You know, the question's not about supernatural, but the supernatural helps with the horror because you have demonic possession and you just have this full outside force you can't control. It almost feels like fate when um, it, uh, Peter finally gets overtaken by this entity. And, um, you know, it, it's just like you talk about like the performances, the filmmaking aspect of it, dude, like shit. These performances did not win Oscars, but they should have. Tony Collette should have won an Oscar. It came out way too early. So I feel like the Oscar uh, noms for those doesn't matter. And actually also horror is very underrepresented in Oscar history too. So like, I feel like uh, Silence winning Oscars kind of goes against it being more of a horror film because I feel like they saw, oh, this is more of a drama mystery type of thing. So we're going to give this, you know, a nod, but they wouldn't probably give Hereditary a nod like that. And the filmmaking of this, Ari Aster fucking crushed with uh, this being his first film. And just the way they show these uh, shots, you know, panning, uh, panning over just like intricately just to show the exact thing that you want. I just feel like the filmmaking in silence isn't as, uh, you know, great, to be honest. Sisters is a horror film, won an Oscar. Joss is a horror film, but won an Oscar. Max Horn is a horror film, won an Oscar. The year before, my hair had taken in. Get Out is a horror film, won an Oscar. So even though it doesn't bring up more than much of here, I don't feel like it was more representation with it. But you see, again, the point what I'm trying to make here is like, but honestly, Oscars things, aren't the end all be all of what I know, makes I know, a great horror film. I know. But the point is, what I'm trying to point out is, silence is sort of like, not only sort of, not say the starting point, but I don't want to contradict what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say here is, it brings a sort of more like taking like more of a pulpy story. The book is sort of based on the book. It brings like sort of more to warrant it out so right here's a more endearing story along with it which i could say well i don't want to make sort of puns when saying it's so a more digestible even more the darker elements right here it's more of all the characters honestly i feel like the book goes into buffalo bill's uh backstory way more and i feel like if they would have done that with this one it would have felt less weird with all the you know transgender stuff with it and um it just kind of feels gross uh to that effect and you know hereditary um basically uh you know, it, it fucking puts you in this and it makes you feel so psychologically messed up um after being in time. All right, we are moving into the one minute close. Chad, since you started us off, it is you are starting us off on the closing. One minute to finish up your argument. I feel like Hereditary down the road is going to be like considered one of the one of the greatest uh, horror films ever made. One of the greatest films ever made. Ari Aster jumped in here with his first uh, one, and then he went on to make like Midsummer, and he's going to make another one that's even uh, just just as great, probably. And I'm just like so excited for the future of horror with this one. Whereas Silence of the Lambs. Lambs feels kind of dated. It doesn't feel really much like a horror film, except for a couple parts. And um, Hereditary is a horror movie through and through. You see the tragic downfall of this, you know, psychologically damaged, uh, you know, you see like an apparition just in the background, just lingering. And then, you, you know, and then you see the shot of the mom up in the corner and it just lingers on that shot and just lets you kind of go like, holy shit, there that is. And Silence of the Lamb just ha doesn't have any scares like that. And it's just not that as psychological. And time. All right, Jonathan, minute on the clock to close up this argument. Science of the Lambs it brought you to, like I mentioned earlier, the mental mind gains to it. Brings like the tension. Like I mentioned earlier, Hannibal Lecter is in like only like five minutes in the movie. Even when he's not appearance is not there, you feel his presence is there in a psychological mental state when he does though. It even brings 
some of the cases when they bury agents along with that with Claire Sterling along with that. It would just brings like a more attention feel to it right here or aspects along with it. It's sort of like more parts of like you're just more extreme to some extent, but that's horror is like more kind of the uh, right a little more grounded to it. More will feel grounded along with it. That's a, maybe the scary parts of horror when you just don't feel grounded. I feel like this movie really does that along with it. So that's the reason I, I use that more than both sides of the land. Concede. Conceding two seconds. All right. As we get the judges in, uh, not a lot of uh, facts were stated uh, to be fact checked, um, but Silence of the Lambs, uh, 1991, did win the Big Five uh, for the Oscars, one of three films to do it. Um, Heredity came out in 2018, did not win an Oscar. However, there is a parent's guide um, letting you know if you should take your child to watch this film. The fact that we live in an age where you have to search the internet on whether you should take your child to watch a rated R horror film is beyond me. So with that, Chris, we are just going to start off with you. Who gets your point on this one and why? This is tough because I do love both movies, but Chad won it over for me in the end. Okay, he gave a damn on the film. He gave a damn for why you're a psychological horror movie and that's what I needed to hear. I feel like in on the Timber Tip Jimmy Fair, but I'd love to hear more about Times Land besides Brad Chetney and Oscar, but that Chad pull out for me at the end. All right, and then Jordan, I'm going to pull the audible and go ahead and go to you. Who gets your point on this one? So for me, I think I got to go Jonathan this time. Like I think that that like he probably brought a few less points and maybe kind of re reiterated them a little more. But but like I really like his his point about um, uh, Hannibal Lecter only being in there for five minutes of the movie. You just feel his his presence throughout the the whole movie, and then I, I like when he uh, brought up that that um, Predator is more of a supernatural horror movie versus a, a psychological. So, so there, there's that, and, and then just bringing up all all the great performances and uh, the fact that that like when he was able to just come back with, with like how many different horror movies actually won Oscars to to kind of counter at Chad's point about uh, about horror movies in the Oscar. That thought was was pretty solid too. So you know, I'll give it to Jonathan. All right, so we are tied one to one. Haven, again, you are going to be the deciding vote. Who will get your points in this argument? I'm gonna go with Chad. You know, he made a lot of points. I can see what Jonathan was saying when, uh, not yeah, when he was trying to bring up all the movies that won Oscars. But when it comes to a horror movie, you know, especially one that we were talking about. I think that hereditary and what Chad was bringing up the most points. That's why I have to give it to him in this one. All right. Haven giving it to Chad. Which means, and your winner, Chad Webb. As we get him big on yeah. screen, you see the excitement in his face. Chad, you pulled it out. Um, great match, by the way. Uh, winning Thanks. is always great. The fact that you did it in your debut has to feel a mm -hmm. lot sweeter. How are yes. you feeling uh, after oh, that? I, my heart's pounding. After the first two rounds, honestly, like it just felt like kind of I, I might I might have it in the bag. I don't know, and it just felt really good about my third round. But the, the votes didn't go, go my way. I was, like, really surprised. But then I was like, you know, hey, you know, that sometimes that's that's the way it is. Like, you know, I think my arguments are the best. And, you know, so I'm like, me, me, me. And then, you know, all of a sudden they go another way. And then I'm like, oh, shit, okay, I actually have to play now. And um, I feel like Jonathan pulled it out. He, like, I was like, oh, my God, he's actually going to force me to play now. And then, you know, uh, not that he didn't do great in his first two rounds. He did. But, you know, I just feel like, you know, he, he really, like, made me fight for it at the end there. And I was I was so nervous about that fourth round because, you know, 
Uh, I really, I really like Simons of the Lambs too, and um, I felt like he did a, a great job, you know, trying to defend that movie, and um, which is almost, uh, you know, uh, it's it's really easy to defend that movie, and I, I feel like he did a great job with all of his rounds, and I just. I came out on top. It feels really good, and um, you know, I just I'm I'm afraid for whoever I have to face next because it, you know I don't I don't it might be harder. Definitely. <laughs> well, debates always have that way of, of making you realize you're not as good as you thought you were. Um, I've <laughs> definitely right. been there. Of how did I not get that point? Oh, three people didn't think yeah. I got that point, so I should, probably shouldn't yeah. have gotten that one. But that again, works. with this with this win, you out. are. You are uh, being thrown into our winners uh, tournaments or our one and O oh, because Aaron doesn't like pe calling people winners <laughs> and losers apparently. Uh, but you will be taking on Austin Pez Howell who beat that Jacob Barber in his first match. How are you feeling after I announced who you're playing? Honestly, I mean, I don't know him that well. I think, uh, I think he made judge a little bit and stuff you know it, it seems like you know if it's the same person that i that i'm thinking of you know uh he might know a lot of what he's talking about obviously he won you know so you know it's just going to be a, a tougher thing knowing i'm, I'm going up against a uh a strong competitor well uh, you know a strong uh, maybe a stronger competitor i don't know i don't want to besmirch any any of my uh past components uh, opponents but um you know yeah i mean i'm gonna have to bring it if i want to stay in the uh one and oh or if i want to become two and oh so you know um I, i'm excited but nervous definitely but we look forward uh to see you hopefully continue move forward in the tournament and not just be a one and done but with that i will say adieu as we kick you into the back and i bring in the second place finisher jonathan <laughs> peck jonathan <laughs> you did have a great uh a great argument in both round one and round two. It just didn't come your way. And then able to pull out round uh, question number three to avoid getting knocked out. I don't know if Aaron considers knockouts, um, but we'll talk about that later. How are you feeling um, after that? One word, tired. Yeah. Uh, you had to push through it. Okay. Um, well, the only thing I can say about this is Based on the funny quote, it's like, LNG is stupid, so. Yeah, and uh, I just want to say, Chad, you did a great job. And I'll be honest right here. I hope you do great in your next match. And basically, I did put my A-game on one with it. Maybe I wish I could have done better if I wasn't so uh, tired on one with it. But still, you did a great job on one with it. And for me, I just want to say, Maybe I'll get more and a little rest up the next time if I have a movie battleground match. The schedule allows me to do it. So, yeah, I just want to say congratulations to Chad. And basically, I hope you can kick ass in your next match. Yeah, congratulating uh, his victor, uh, wishing his victor luck. That's class right there. Uh, Jonathan, we got to love the class. But again, uh, you will be thrown into the 0-1 uh, bracket. The losers bracket. Not calling anyone losers, but yeah, zero and one uh, is a below awesome. five hundred record. Um, you will be taking on Sean Hunter, uh, the Porcelain King, I believe is his nickname in TM Geek. Um, writes answers on uh, plates, but in debates, he took on Grant Gregory. Did not come out with the win, uh, so he will be your opponent. How are you feeling on that? Um, I don't know anything about Sean Hunter, I'll be honest with you, and I hope, makes you say, rest his ass on plates, so I can use that, maybe an advantage of it, so I just pretend, just pretend invisible plates at him, I hope that'll work, and, uh, well, uh, we'll see, and we'll see, and I hope you can brain it, every time you get so next time, I'll more brain it this time, this time it's a little more, a little faster, a little looser, so, that's all I can personally can say about that. Definitely. Well, again, Jonathan, good luck uh, in that match against Sean. Uh, just like with Chad, I hope you go a long way. Because um, you always hope the best for everybody as we kick you out into the back room. And just bring in me. Um, 
Uh, again, I do want to say, Aaron, thank you so much uh, for letting me uh, host for you while you take a little break. I am always willing to do that. Uh, fantastic match between Chad and Jonathan. I do also want to say thank you so much, uh, Chris, Jordan, and Haven for coming and judging because this would not be possible without the three of y'all um, and our amazing team of judges. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule uh, to judge for us. But enough of the niceness. This is Battlegrounds, where we have battles. But so long. Have a good one. Stay safe or don't. I don't care. I'm not your dad. But I could be your papa. <laughs>